class of the future is Mr. Kirby Erner. Greetings. So a lot of you already know me from my cyber presence. I, where do I fit into the Python community? You'll find me over on EduSig, one of our many uh, lists, and I'm very prolific there. I apologize, but uh, I always think because disk space is cheap, you know, it doesn't matter if people read it. Anyway, archiving stuff is great, and uh, I was kind of thinking this would be more of an internet show and tell that I would sort of take you around cyberspace and show you things, but internet's kind of flaky here. I do have a lot of things to show you, though. It's more of a show and tell talk. Um, how did I get into all this? I'm a big Bucky Fuller guy and going way back, and I wanted to do polyhedra. I wanted to see them, and the net was new. It was like I've got gray hair. I go back to before Mosaic and all that, and there weren't many polyhedra out there on the web, and so I cobbled together DBase, because I was a DBase programmer, and POV Ray, and started coming up with icosahedra and stuff like that. You can see these little polyhedra here. And then, you know, that wasn't, I got an article published in Fox Pro Advisor, because it was so weird to have somebody using Fox Pro to do polyhedra. They'd never seen that before. Um, but even before that, back in Princeton days when I was a philosophy major, I could either use Fortran on punch cards or I could use APL. And APL, I could talk directly to the mainframe, get an answer right back. DBase is the same way. It has what we call a dot prompt. So I've always been this interactive. I, I mean, I loved APL and I hated Fortran, to just sum it up. And Kenneth Iverson, who invented APL, he, he noticed what I was doing after a while. He helped me. If you go to one of my pages, which is, I named it after Guido's Computer Programming for Everyone, which, of course, uh, with a cp4e.html. Of course, we all know about that um, initiative originally, which got DARPA funding mainly to build IDLE in the early days. Um, but if you scroll down past all my Python stuff, you'll see I have a lot of stuff, not a lot of stuff, but I have some stuff on the J language. Anybody here know the J language? Yeah, see, that's really a weird one. And um, But that's what Kenneth Iverson, who invented APL, went on to do, is he created J which, unlike APL, uses regular ASCII text, but it still looks like a modem gone crazy. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's wild stuff. And he helped me debug some of the stuff I was doing in J. But what I'm winding up to with this point is, here we are in early 21st century, and what is it about computer programming that's appealing to, say, a math teacher? I'm a high school math teacher. I have been faculty on so, so forth. Why would we want to use programming in a math class? And I would say up till recently we wouldn't because there's just too much overhead, too much garbage. You got to learn all this, you know, stuff that's not all that relevant. But the J language and the APL were designed to be math notations first and foremost. Kenneth Iverson did APL as a chalkboard notation. It looks like little Greek characters and stuff. It looks like math is supposed to look really cryptic. And then it was put onto computers. And that's sort of the heritage that I'm interested in. I'm thinking of students wanting to learn math and finding out that programming in Python really helps them understand how math works. And I would say this really wasn't interesting to math teachers until we had this object-oriented programming and until we had operator overloading. It's like for, for a CS curriculum, those are considered maybe second-year topics. Why would we want to use operator overloading and, and objects uh, in the first week? Well, I, in a math class, we use operator overloading and objects in the first 20 minutes. We have to because that's what we're interested in. Um, let's see. One of the schools I'm working with that just, just came out, there's a charter school up in Alaska. They're going to try this approach, possibly. It hasn't, the school hasn't been approved yet, but the woman behind it, um, has a track record of already creating schools, so I think it may well fly. And the math faculty up there is looking at this Python stuff and thinking, hmm, that might be useful. Now, to sort of get the ball rolling, I have like Python for math teachers on Show Me Do, and I have like five videos here. So you can sort of get a feeling for what I'm looking at or what I'm trying to do. We're actually thinking this will affect the curriculum somewhat. Right now we're all headed towards senior year. We gotta know calculus. We gotta be AP calculus gurus so we can get into a good college. Well, that's, you know, within the last 20 years, that's come and gone, or that's come. But the future may be different. And I'm thinking by 
senior year high school, what you're going to want to know is why does RSA work, you know, the public key cryptography. That's what you're going to need to know by 12th grade. And having this background in number theory and group theory, that's really going to help. And where are you going to get that? Well, because you learned Python early, um, RSA is no problem when you finally get to that part of it. Now let me, I got this eye candy. So here I am writing to the, doing stuff for the Alaskan Thunderbird Early College thing. So let's look at some actual code here. I'm sorry about this screen sliding around here, but um, so here's the kind of thing we might do. And I kind of am not being effective here because I'm showing you something that's not object-oriented programming. But it is still considered a somewhat advanced feature of Python, or at least it came late in the game. But let's start right out with generators really early, and let's generate Pascal's triangle. And this is actually in the PIPI thing that's going out on the XO. They generate Pascal's triangle, but they don't use it. They don't do it using generators yet. Maybe they will. But this is also written in Python 3, if that matters. I mean, there's hardly any difference uh, except with the next. Uh, when, you, when you go a next in a generator in Python 3, you do it like a function. You don't put a dot next or anything like that. Um, but what are we doing here with Pascal's triangle? We are simply uh, taking the row and sticking a zero on the front of the row, a zero on the back, zipping them up, adding them together, and creating another row of Pascal's triangle. Um, and how that would look is further down. What I actually do is then read off columns of Pascal's triangle to get the uh, triangular and tetrahedral numbers. And we go to the... Um, Online Encyclopedia of Digital of Integer Sequences by Sloan, and there you have a gold mine of numbers that grow because of something geometric. And what we're finding with with a younger age set is you want to bridge sort of graphical and lexical, but you don't need to do it the way we normally do it, always with coordinates x y z and x y z axes and so on. There's another bridge that could come much earlier which is when you're making a triangle, you have one ball, then you have three balls, then you have six balls, and you can start doing that sort of graphical thinking and modeling and showing and building. You can actually use ping pong balls and whatever, and the very lexical thing that is programming, and that is math. I mean, math is very left brain in terms of writing stuff, and you know, you really have to know how to type and this kind of thing, and uh, you know, programming is a lexical thing. I don't really go with the philosophy of Oh, because they're younger people, we should make it all graphical and gooey. And if they ever have to touch the keyboard instead of a mouse, you know, it should all be click, 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 and that's every, everything they need to know. I'm not in that school, basically because I think Python comes in the pipeline a little bit later in a student's career. The first thing you do is you pilot an avatar like, like Logo did, except that the game graphics are getting so much better that really it's like Sims. Like, my daughter plays Sims all the time, but it could be first person, whatever, like a first person shoot up. Writing little programs where you're piloting an object, uh, that came earlier in your career. You're already past that by the time you get to me. And we just want you to understand how this stuff works behind the scenes. We want you to know um, why this works, and, and we also want you to understand math. So here would, here would be like an early introduction to objects. I would throw away that call method maybe, but I kind of wanted to use it here. But this is how simple, you know, Python really can be when you're just starting out. And this is, this is like hello world. This is where we start. I don't care about procedural programming. I assume I've never heard of it. It, g it gives me the creeps. I just like to start here. And we have some creature. And it gets born. I actually have people an, uh, initialize is a birth event, and they're, they're very used to creatures. We're going to use that metaphor heavily, and they, they need to eat. And so we append the food to the stomach. And the fun part is you can use this interactively. So you just have a little bit of code. You can explain it fairly quickly, and then you go to idle or whatever shell, and you start creating biotum objects, and you start interacting with them. And then it's just a small step to go from something creaturely to something more mathematical. Uh, let me see what's a good example. Let me do another creature first. Uh, I often start with an example very similar to this, which is a little bit more advanced than a biotum. So you can start talking about evolution if you want. But you know, now we're going to do a whole snake. And uh, notice how I, 
I do this on Edge of SIG a lot, and I think it probably irritates some people, but I consider it a very pedagogically advantageous thing to refer to special names with their strange underbar look and feel, which is an odd look of Python. It's like it jumps out at you, especially when you write code the way we do, which is all kinds of operator overloading. Call those things ribs, because they look kind of like ribs, and if your, snake is, if your class is actually a snake, you know how many ribs snake, snakes have. So I kind of associate that fundamentally in their thinking. They, they, they think of Python as a snake, obviously. They've forgotten about Monty Python. A lot of the people I work with, they know it, but you know, it's like, we're all gonna think of it as a snake now. And uh, look how many ribs snakes have. I mean, there are abundance of ribs. And special names look like ribs. And so I, um, I talk about the rib syntax and stuff like that, and they, they, they like that. And the fact that we're dealing with a creature. It is a snake, it does get born, it has a stomach. And when it eats, it adds, uh, it adds to the stomach. And I, I put here how kids like scatological stuff. If you're gonna eat, you also gotta poop it out. So that's a good place to start talking about cues. <laughs> like here we are, um, here we are with the snake. That, that, that code I just showed you is enough to drive this example. That's all you need. And here I get a little esoteric. I have the snake eat itself. Ooh. But we, we do like to have creatures eat each other. In my Python for Math teachers, we usually start with a dog class and a monkey class. And then we create a mammal class and show how, you know, a little bit of polymorphism. Again, I don't have the burden of a CS1 curriculum. I'm not trying to make programmers. I'm trying to make people who understand fractions. Now, how do people understand fractions? Create a fraction object. Create a rational number class and add two fractions. What do you have to do? And then you have to simplify it. You have to get the lowest common denominator and all this kind of stuff. That's where Euclid's algorithm comes in. That's where all kinds of basic math comes in. So basically, we build math objects. We build fractions probably one of the first ones. Then we build integers that add modulo something. So instead of three plus two equals five, you get three plus two equals two or something because of the modulo. And there's a lot of little group theory things you can play with with modulo arithmetic. They're very accessible to kids. I'm talking like high school. And one of the problems with the curriculum we have right now is we have what I call calculus mountain. Calculus mountain is this killer and we, the point of it, why it was put in there, is to kill most kids. It's like, if you can't make it through this mountain, then you're not going to go to college. You never have a technical career. You didn't know calculus or whatever. And so you kill a bunch of kids. It's kind of like that Lord of the Rings where they're trying to go over it before they try mortar. But, you know, it's like all that snow and everything. And uh, you lose most kids. And then on the other side of Calculus Mountain, there's this simple kind of group theory stuff and number theory that doesn't take a lot of background. You can do it in Python. And I call these the clear pools on the other side of Calculus Mountain. They're just so easy. They're just fun. You learn about totients and totatives and Euler and big names. And it's like, oh, I'm really learning math. Why didn't we just go around Calculus Mountain to those cliffs? Or at least have a chairlift, right? <laughs> I, I, I hear people agreeing with that. We're also really uh, into visualization. This is another lesson plan for these kids. Basically a generation or two or three before us have created Unix, they've created a command line, they've created piping. It's like our forebearers, our ancestors, who are still among us, I'm one of them, but we're, we've created a new culture here, it's this geek culture. And the point of education is not to always be the same, the same, the same. We need to now incorporate that, and kids need to start where we are, not where we were. So the command line has got to be part of an everyday high school experience or younger. So here they're learning how they can pipe things. This is some guy open source completely here, C++. I'm kind of off the topic of Python, but I'm just showing you that the wider curriculum, we're in a math curriculum here, includes feeling comfortable using POSIX, you know, the thing about where you can pipe things and stuff like that. That should just be part of everybody's fluency now. Nu numeracy now includes feeling comfortable um, stringing commands together. It's just something we do. I'm not saying they have to learn awk. Um, you know, I'm not saying, but you see, this is high school, this is pre-college. 
you dabble in Python, you learn some rational numbers with Python, you learn, what else do we build? We build vectors here. Let me qu quick do an example. How am I doing for time? Okay. Let me try an example in Python 2.5. So that's import R. Buckminster Fuller. And then I'm already talking about namespaces. The very first, imagine you're my first class, and this is, you just met me, and we're starting down the Python path. And I would say, okay, I've just imported a namespace, and it's blah, 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 blah. And I start doing stuff like that right away. You know, it's, actually, I would do a DIR before the import and a DIR after the import, and I would just say, notice how many more names there are. That's kind of what we mean by a namespace. Namespace is such an important thing because it really means context. And to understand anything about life, even in literature class or any class, you have to know that when you walk into a room, you're in a namespace. And when people say George Bush or whatever, they don't mean the same thing, honestly. I, I can tell you, you know. All I did is say, imp create an icosahedron and draw it. And there's my icosahedron. And, you know, I don't make kids code from zero. I think the, the wrong, when you learn an English language or any language, you walk into a room, adults are speaking it fluently. The way to learn Python is to look at a lot of code. Don't just stare at a blank screen and say, okay, kids, start writing Python. It's like scaffolding is part of it. And the nice thing about VPython, I'm sure you've all seen this, but and you can zoom in and zoom out and all that kind of stuff. It's, a, it's like VRML, except. And so then we'll go into the code. So what are we building? I, I'm getting back to a certain question I asked myself a second ago. We build rational numbers. We learn about fractions because we overload add. We overload multiply. You have to know what happens to that numerator and denominator. And uh, you have to know how you simplify. We use Euclid's method. Now, how many state curricula, if you know the math wars, we're in a war right now. You probably didn't know that because mathematicians are so low key. But how do we teach? They do have hunger strikes, though. How do we teach? kids math it's not like this is a known answer it's like you're you just asked a question you're ready for a fist fight now you know people fight about this and um, so so Euclid's method do we teach that in high school no we mostly don't and why don't we well we don't really have a good reason uh, we don't really know so now I'm going to state legislatures I'm not going but I'm saying let's look at the state standards out there and see which smart which states include Euclid's method those are the smart states it's like on news when they show certain states lift out in red. Those are the, where they have a little bit of brains. And, you know, I like states to compete. That's what we're part of in this, this particular country. Every state's supposed to be a laboratory. So I like to play with that. It's like your state's not using Python. See, I come from Portland, and Christian Science Monitor said we're the open source capital of the world. Okay. Who am I to disagree? Um, so when I go to, like, Lithuania, which I did for EuroPython or whatever, it's like, hey, I'm from Portland, you know. This is how we do it, okay, get used to it. So I kind of, you know, it's like this is the future. Now, I'm not really that hardcore, but I like math teachers when I talk to them to sort of get the feeling that this may actually be the future. I mean, this is a fun way to learn math. Kids beg me to, like, save them from their regular stuff. They come to my class at Saturday Academy. We do stuff like this, and on the last day, it's like, no, don't send me back to hell, <laughs> you know? Um, are we ready for questions, I wonder? Okay, so wait, I'm answering my question. We build rational numbers, we build integers modulo x, we build vectors. You've got to build vectors. And the coolest thing is to just sit there and idle at the command prompt and say vector 1 equals, in, you know, 0, 0, 1, vector 2 equals 0, 0, 2. You give birth to vectors through the vector class. And then you can just add them. You can add two vectors, and they add, and it gives you the answer. And that's why I'm saying mathematicians didn't really, math teachers shouldn't have cared about programming until Python, because Java, C++, that's just too much overhead. It's going to get you off topic. But now at last, we can teach kids vectors better than they ever knew them before, because they can create them as objects. It's a hand-on activity. They can look at the, someone else's code. They can write their own code. You can scale vectors. Once you have a vector class, then you need an edge class, because all my vectors start at, at the origin. They're tail originating vectors. They can only point from the origin to somewhere. So if you want an edge, that's defined by two vector objects. And then once you've got an e the tips connect, that's your edge. And then you need a polyhedron. Well, that's a bunch of edges and stuff like that. 
So pretty soon, you know, we're doing spatial geometry, we're understanding vectors. This is all part of the state standards, or maybe not. Maybe your state doesn't do vectors. So anyway, that's kind of where we're at. Now, um, I say we and stuff like that a lot. I'm kind of like a vendor. I'm kind of like the guy who goes to the math teachers and helps them learn Python and other things once they convince that that's the way to go. And I don't have any of those contracts. Because this is all beginning stuff. I'm getting back to reality here. Portland's just like every place else. We teach the same stuff. There's not a lot of Python going on. Um, but I bill myself as a futurist. And if I want to get, and because of the Bucky thing, and I'm very well known in the Bucky community, it, it sticks. I can do that. I can call myself a futurist, and it doesn't come off being a lie. And if I want to get weird about it, I have a big black hat, and I put that on, and I say, I'm a Quaker futurist. Because they're thinking, where's your horse, you know? <laughs> it's because of Amish or whatever. But Quakers actually have a lot of sort of, they help found some of the schools in this country, and I get fan mail from places like Haverford and places. So I use my connections to try to push this into the private schools where I can't work with the public in the same way. You know, there's different ways. But basically, just know that I'm out there pushing Python into math classes. And it's a different culture. They're not, they're not the geeks that I'm talking to right here. Math teachers think differently. I mean, you could say this. They're not really facing the same set of situations. So it, it's fun because you're liberated from teaching computer science, where you really have to worry about what if they don't get that some variables should be private, or what about, you know, all that stuff that matters if you're really going to program for a living. But these kids haven't made that decision yet. They're just in high school. They just need to learn math so that we can teach them fun, easy Python that doesn't have all those, like, caveats and, oh, but, you know, you'll never understand Java if you teach. You know, let's, let's let the computer people worry about that later when they go to college. And they'll already know Python. So it'll be so much easier for CS teachers in the future because they're going to be able to assume, oh, you went to that school. Well, don't they use Python and math? Yeah, starting in eighth grade, we, we've used Python and math. So we know Python. I mean, duh. I mean, <laughs> so it's going to be, I think, a good future uh, for Python here. Okay, now I'm ready for questions. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. I mean, what's very cool about Python is you can pass functions top level. So there is sections on, say, taking a derivative where you just define a function. Here's another thing I wanted to get across is, first of all, the question, I'm supposed to repeat the question, what about calculus? You know, we can't, that mountain's not just going to be bulldozed. I mean, you do need to, and we tunnel maybe, but. Um, so it's very cool to pass a function into Python, into the differentiator, and have it just take whatever function you pass in, make a very small h and do f, 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 you know, do the little derivative thing that you do, and pass out another function that actually, when you feed it an argument, it takes the derivative at that point. If you understand calculus, that's very important to understand that derivative eats functions and returns functions. And that's considered a tough, co you know, Spivak had trouble getting that across. So, you know, you can get more sophisticated calculus because you've got the Python basis for it. Um, okay, another, any other questions? Yes, sir. Exactly right. Like four years ago, I'm in front of a group at OSCON just like this, and I'm saying, look, Ruby, Perl, because they're all there. It's not like all Python. Let's stop fighting. I mean, we can compete in a friendly way, but let's all find a common enemy. What do you think? And they're like, okay, who do you think? And I say, Texas Instruments. And they're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but you think, see, I'm not really anti-calculator. I'm thinking Guido's beginning tutorial is using Python as a calculator. And what you need to realize is when you start defining objects off to the side in your text editor, you haven't stopped using Python as a calculator. You're doing vectors now. And you can raise numbers to huge powers. The first thing I have kids do is raise two to like the 10,000th power. And it just fills their screen with digits. And I say, can your calculator do that? You know? <laughs> it's like I do cast dispersions on calculators because, yes, sir. There's that aspect to it, but think about it abstractly. We have something called addition, but when you add two integers, are you doing the same thing as when you add two vectors? No. 
Uh, multiplication, it's an operation, we have a symbol for it, but when you multiply two matrices, is it the same as multiplying two floating po point numbers? No. So when you build these objects and overload the operators, add, double, under, under, add, under, under, multiply, when you overload those a number of times on different kinds of objects, you're starting to think both in terms of types it's like, oh, this is, a, this is a vector type, so addition looks different than when I add fractions. This is a fraction type. Why do we even call it addition both times? What do they have in common? Well, there's things called additive identity, multiplicative. You start to think abstractly about everything that addition has in common across types. And you can start of thinking of math itself as an extensible type system. That's what math is. You know, what's a quaternion? Well, you take a vector and have something else and you smash them together and, you know, everything's made out of things that came before. What is Python? Same thing. So what Kenneth Iverson said is, look at APL as a math notation. The only difference between a textbook math notation and something like APL is APL executes. And that's the thing about Python. It doesn't just sit there looking pretty like math textbooks. It actually runs. And so we're talking about looking at Python as a way to express math concepts, just like Greek letters do. But we don't need Greek letters, except we're getting them with Unicode, so we can have. <laughs> Anyone else? Question, sir? Uh, with the jacket. And then, yeah. Well, you know, because that would be hypocritical for me to push that, because one of the things I cast aspersions on with the calculators is those tiny little screens. And don't you want a big flat screen, you know? So when I go to teachers telling them how your math class can be better than their math class, it's all about how calculators have such bad I.O. They don't even have a mouse, you know? <laughs> you can imagine a T.I. with a mouse. You, you sir, had a question? Okay, well, as a futurist, I like dive bomb in wherever I can. So I've done volunteer hours for no pay except you know, whoever pays me, but sponsors, whatever, uh, to do eighth grade. And then we're Saturday Academy, which is a private thing, a nonprofit. I do like 10th through 12th grade. And so I'm basically in the high school range. Does that answer your question? Saturday Academy just has a huge catalog that comes out four times a year with lots of courses, everything from puppetry to what, you know, it's one of those kind of things. But they want to change that so that the computer stuff that you do, you can get credit for. So pretty soon, it will be an alternative, not just a fun thing to do on Saturday. It's called Saturday Academy because kids give up their Saturdays to go, and obviously that's a special kind of kid who wants to learn Python instead of being outside. But, you know, I think math, we should have more math outdoors also. It's totally ethnic what we call math, and right now it's this indoor thing. But in my future plan, you asked about my secret future plans, you need a GPS, you need to know how to use it. You're gonna have an electric ATV, yeah, all track, all train vehicle. And if you go out there and you can't find your way back, you fail your math class. 